Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man that has wagered everything he owns on Saturday's big Mayweather-McGregor fight, including the deed to the garage. He is the captain. I am boxing. It's good to be seen, and it's good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. Hopefully you're right, Captain, or we're going to be outdoors, people. Well, we always have tents and parts unknown. Tonight we are drinking Solar Dog IPA by the brilliant minds over at Astoria Brewing Company in beautiful Astoria, Oregon. Garage grade, three and a half bottle caps out of five. This is a pretty straightforward IPA with a blend of citrus notes and a smooth malty finish. And Solar Dog was brought to us by these shiny garage stars. First up, we have Ava in Gordonsville, Virginia. We also have Rachel in Grove City, which I don't know if this is uh, like, I know Rachel in Grove City. Mm -hmm. Like this might be uh, AKA Randall in Grove City. And uh, if it is, big shout out to Austin as well. Next, we have Ashton in Parts Unknown. We also have Sarah who says she's working at the Outpost. And parts unknown. That must be actually past the border because I didn't realize we had an outpost. We have an in post. <laughs> and here's a note from Renee in parts unknown. She says she could listen to Nick read the phone book and she loves the captain's rants. <laughs> you can listen to read the phone book if you want to go to bed. <laughs> And next up, all the way from California, we have Catherine in Morega. And last but not least, we have Ryan up in beautiful Ontario, Canada. So thanks to everybody for filling up the fridge for this week's show. And we'll need to do a beer run for next week's show. So if you want to help out, go to truecrimegarage.com and click on the donate button. Yes, the refrigerator is low. And for everything social media, follow us on Facebook, Snapchat, Twitter, Instagram, all that stuff at True Crime Garage. All right, Captain, that's enough of the business. Everybody gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. Mia Zapata was born and raised in Louisville, Kentucky. She learned how to play the guitar and piano at a young age and was influenced by punk rock, jazz, blues, and R&B. In 1984, Mia Zapata enrolled at a college in Yellow Springs, Ohio as a liberal arts student. In 1986, she and three friends formed the punk rock band The Gits. In 1989, the band relocated to Seattle, Washington. In 1990 and 1991, the band released a series of well-received singles on local independent record labels. As the Gits were making a name for themselves in the local music scene, Mia Zapata was murdered in 1993. The investigation only led to a lack of leads. And with little evidence, many investigators feared Mia Zapata's murder case would remain forever unsolved. But the remaining members of the Gits refuse to let Mia's case go cold. Mia Zapata was born August 25th, 1965 in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, Her parents were in the broadcast business. They were fairly well off and provided a very comfortable life uh, for young Mia growing up. Now, she got involved in music at a young age, taking up piano and guitar. And it was obvious from that young age that she was quite talented at both. Yeah, Mia's going to head off to college, and she's going to go to Antioch, so she's going to head to our neck of the woods uh, in Yellow Springs, Ohio. A lot of people might be familiar with this. This is where Dave Chappelle resides. Mm -hmm. There's one hell of a brewing company in Yellow Springs as well. Uh, She moved up there in 1984 to attend college, and then in 1986, she, with three friends, formed a punk rock band called The Gits. Uh, This included guitarist Andrew Kessler, drummer Steve Moriarty, and bassist Matt Dresner. Now, Antioch College is a liberal arts college, 
and there was actually a pretty big um, venue there before called Peaches. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it's still there. Um, played a couple gigs there in my day, but it was it was more popular in the in the early nineties. Yeah, and I tell you what, uh, their band was around for a few years before they decided to move off to Seattle. Now the thing here is, Captain. You and I both know from having played in Columbus, Columbus obviously being a very big uh, college town, you know, Mm -hmm. not only the capital of the state, but we have the Ohio State University here. Mm -hmm. Um, So you and I know that if if you have a certain level of talent and a certain level of showmanship, it's not real hard to be a successful college band. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, you have to have drive. and, And obviously this band had drive, enough drive to say, hey, we might have outgrown um, Yellow Springs, Ohio, and, and maybe we should take our talents uh, to a bigger, uh, bigger town, and not even just moving, you know, forty some minutes to Columbus. But hey, let's to go where some real stuff is happening uh, in Seattle. Yeah, and the thing here is, Captain, it's not, in my opinion, too terribly hard to get a large following when you play in a college town. Because the the college itself and the students and your friends that you have in the area, if you have the talent, it creates a natural following. Yeah, but this again, this is also the 90s. I mean, there's kind of a new music explosion in the 90s. And, and I'd say today it would be a way different. It would be way harder. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they decide to take their talent to Seattle. Now, at the time, Seattle, I mean, is just booming. Mm-hmm. With 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 musical talent and great bands coming out of there, yeah, we all know the big ones. You know, uh, Soundgarden, Pearl Jam, Nirvana, Alice in Chains, Reverend Horton Heat, uh, and there's probably many other great ones that we're leaving out. Um, but this is really striking it out on their own, and really a brave thing to do. You and I know that that one just having a band that can last a few years together. Mm-hmm. You know, they say that they started as friends first and then became a band. Uh, that's how most bands start as friends. Now, most of the time, they don't always leave as friends. So, just to be together for a few years and then to decide to strike it out on your own in an area so competitive uh, with great music like Seattle is really a brave thing to do. Well, it probably made their bond stronger as uh, on a personal level. I think you're right. You know, you you have to become even closer friends by that point because you're kind of your your bandmates kind of become your last line of defense when you take it that far away from from where you've started off. Well, and they're also doing um a lot of touring as well. And and it's it's a very weird connection um and and we have this with our high school going into college band. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's almost like um, there there's still a group of people that associate me with the other three guys or the other guys with the other three guys. We're forever linked in some people's minds. Right. I mean, I get asked more about ex band members than I do like family members. Mm-hmm. Uh, the thing here is captain when out in Seattle, um, what kind of band were was the Gits? So it's often often described as a punk rock band, mm-hmm. uh, and I think that's a fair statement. You know, we said that uh, Mia was influenced by punk rock, jazz, blues, and R and B. Uh, I've read many people compare her to like a Janis Joplin or a Stevie Nicks, mm-hmm. uh, maybe even a Joan Jett. The thing here, I didn't when I, when I watched and listened to the music um, that she performed. I didn't get the same vibe, you know, I didn't, I didn't get the vibe. Like I felt like when people were writing that, that they were trying to compare her voice and vocals to those artists. And I I, I think that she was very good at what she did. I just didn't get that vibe from her. I felt she was a little more aggressive, a little more in your face than some of those people. She's more Patty Smith than Janis Joplin. But she's certainly, um, Certainly the type that very artistic and the, the vocals and the lyrics, uh, I thought very well done. Um, but to, to describe her, she's kind of a, um, you know, you would see her in cut off shirts and cut off shorts and mm-hmm. uh, very much the grunge look. One thing that's really cool, Captain, is that we all know that when it comes to hard rock, there's not a whole lot of female uh, that females that front a band. Um, well, and, there's a lot more now, but, but especially in the early 90s. I mean, this is pre Alanis Morissette. Yeah, and this kind of brought in a new crowd to some of that Seattle music scene. 
uh, a lot of the uh, f- female f- fans became mm-hmm. big fans of Mia's. Um, and in 1990, after the band moved to Seattle, the Gits were they were very successful. They went on a successful international tour, spreading the word about the band, all without the support of a record label. And just to show how big they were, I mean, they had groups like uh, Beck. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of people would know who Beck is. Uh, opening up for them at the time. Yeah, and it was in 1992 that they released an independent album uh, titled Frenching the Bully. Uh, This had some hits on it. Yeah, that's a strange... (laughs) Frenching the Bully? Frenching the Bully. What does that mean? Like, tonguing the bully? Like, I guess if there's Mm. some guy that's picking on a bunch of people, you You run up and... No, you run up and shove your tongue down his throat. Mm. And then he shrinks into a little tiny person, and then he's easily defeated. Yeah, or he bl- <laughs> or he blushes. Uh, but this had some hits on it, some independent hits. Uh, one titled "Another Shot of Whiskey," another titled "Second Skin," um, and you know they we say punk rock band, but they were very much a part of this growing, very quickly growing grunge scene that was coming out of Seattle. A lot of people would argue, like Nirvana, for example, has more punk tendencies. Mm-hmm. You know, so yeah, I, I think they fit right in. Well, and the thing with rock and roll music, Captain, is that uh, it's, it's, <laughs> let me tell you, let me let tell, me you, tell about, you about rock and roll. This is behind the music VH1 with, uh, with your buddy, the Colonel. Um, <laughs> the thing with rock and roll music, it's like a lot of other things that we see in pop culture where it's, there's kind of an explosion, right? It's like mm-hmm. an atom bomb goes off. There's an explosion and then there's all these things that when the smoke is rising, when the explosion is hitting There's all these things that get pulled into the mix on the way up and there's things that get pulled into the mix on the way down. And so when you have a band like you talking about, well, what I'm talking about is you have bands like Alice in Chains, you have uh, Soundgarden, Nirvana Mm -hmm. coming out of that same area. Well, what happens then is you have record labels flocking to that area to figure out what the heck is going on. Why is there so much talent in one area, one city? Mm -hmm. And let's grab up some of that talent. Well, and, and possibly one of the reasons why the Gets moved there in, in the beginning. Mm-hmm. But the Gets were very much a part of this explosion, you know, and I I don't know if it was going to be on the way up or the way down, but they mm-hmm. were in the conversation. Uh, they were having talks with some record labels. The one that I heard rumored the most would have been Atlantic Records. Well, it would have been really cool if Jimmy Iovine would have got a hold of them and did what he did with Patti Smith. I don't know who coined the phrase. You remember the phrase, the best band you never heard of? Was that Rolling Stone magazine that, that always, like every year they've got a new best band you've never heard of thing? Yeah. Um, you or know, the best podcast you've never heard of. <laughs> uh, the Gits would have been kind of one of those bands that you might lump into some kind of conversation like that. Mm-hmm. Now, if this is hitting your ears and you're out there going, what do you mean never heard of the Gits? I, full disclosure, I didn't hear, I hadn't heard of the Gits until... Uh, a couple months ago when, when this case came onto our radar. But again, I was not in Seattle in the early nineties. I was, but a, but a small boy wandering around Ohio at that time. (laughs) Um, still a small boy wandering around Ohio, but these are, this is one of those bands that would have been lumped into that group because this, they were playing with big names at the time. They were on the verge of, of a potential record contract. They were touring. Like we said, they had a successful international tour They were working on another album. Um, This one was going to be called The Conquering Chicken. Uh, They spent most of uh, 1993 working on that album. When we were talking off air earlier about one of her friends saying that Mia looked like a chicken. Well, and that's probably why the name The Conquering Chicken for the second album. You know, she she was a, a force. This woman, Mm -hmm. uh, she, she was artistic and she was going to be a force in the scene. And if you would seen her on stage, you know, the footage I've seen, um, she, (laughs) that's the best way to describe her. She was a force. You couldn't take your eyes off of her. Well, and she was an artist. So, um, you know, she was a victim in this horrible crime and we're going to get into that, but please take the time to go back and look at her art and that her life in which she created before, uh, this brutal crime. Yeah, during the time, uh, right around the time of her murder, um, they, like we said, they were working on their second album and they had just come back from a a successful tour and they were gearing up for another tour. Mm -hmm. Um, the way I understand this, this was going to be like a West coast USA tour. Uh, and this was going to be with the band. Many people probably heard of them. Seven year bitch, Mm -hmm. uh, was a band that, that I believe they had some MTV success, uh, when we were younger, I 
couldn't name a song of theirs, but I remember seeing them on TV quite a bit. Um, and that night, this would be in July of 1993, uh, Mia was with several band members and several band members of the band seven year bitch. They were at this local club called the Comet Tavern. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they and this were, is in Capitol Hill, right? Yeah. The Capitol Hill area of Seattle. They are there. They're, this is going to be a celebration. Mm-hmm. Um, they are excited about the upcoming tour. You know, touring means money, means more fans, means getting your name out there, mm-hmm. uh, potentially getting that record contract that you're after. And they're they're going to be out celebrating. They're you know, have a few drinks, shoot some pool, hang out at the bar. It's, but this was a typical this was a typical hangout spot mm-hmm. uh, for band members in this area. Well, Mia would leave the bar around midnight. She was there from about 10 a.m. Oh, I'm sorry, 10 p.m. till midnight. Um, and then she went to a friend's house, uh, somebody that lived just blocks away from the comet. She stayed there till about 2 a.m. Now, her friend says that she tried to talk Mia into staying the night. Uh, Mia says that she's going to get a cab and she's going to head home for the night. Mm-hmm. Um, it's around 3.00. 15 to 3:30 that there's a woman walking near the intersection of 24th Avenue and South Washington Street and she sees the body of a woman a young woman in her mid to late 20s and she happens to be near a fire department so this woman that that sees a victim on the ground decides to run to the fire department and she reports what she has found now the when the fire department arrives according to their report Mia is the victim and she is still warm at this time. Uh, her body's still warm. The fire department tried to resuscitate her. However, they were unsuccessful. The fire department's then going to call this into the police department. Yeah. And so when the, when the police department arrives, uh, the first thing they know is how the body is found. Um, they describe it as like a cross like formation. So her arms are both out to the sides um, and she has her legs crossed with the right leg over top of the left leg. Well, like the crucifixion. Yeah. So it'd be more like Jesus. More like Jesus. Jesus, Jesus on the cross. cross, you know. So uh, in, in most of the crucifixion poses, they have a foot on top of the other foot. She was wearing a hoodie, um, and the, the hood had been pulled down over her face. Uh, one of the strings, or the string from the her hoodie, was wrapped around Mia's neck. Mm -hmm. This area, the first thing that became alarming to the police is one, how her body is found. And two, the area, it's near two churches or a, uh, I should say, a Catholic community services building and a church. So she's kind of lying between these two religious areas and she's in this cross formation. And a possible religious pose. Correct. Um, now, as far as the investigation goes, one thing we have to talk about here, Captain, is when you talk about a body being posed, well, that's a typical serial killer thing that we will see from time to time. Mm-hmm. And we're talking about this is King County. So King County has been, <laughs> they had to deal with Ted Bundy at one point. Mm-hmm. Uh, at this point, the um, Green River Killer investigation is still going on. So this is something that they're very accustomed to and probably something that's always in the back of their minds. Anytime they're finding a a victim, especially a female victim. Well, the police are going to find her bra and panties stuffed into Mia's pockets. There's a portion of her bra that is missing. Mm -hmm. And of course, on the serial killer theory here, captain, that's one thing that they took note of because they wondered, you know, did the, did this killer take some kind of trophy or something to remember this act or event Mm -hmm. with him after he dumped the body. Now we say dumped the body because the first thing that the police were dealing with here is they were convinced that there, this area where she was found, they saw no sign of a struggle. There was nothing to point to them that, that this murder had occurred here, that she was attacked there and killed there. Mm -hmm. Um, They firmly believed that she was killed elsewhere and brought to this location and laid there in this pose. Now, they did find tire tracks uh, that would suggest that maybe somebody had pulled her out of a car, 
placed her on the ground, and then sped off. Well, and it makes you wonder, did she get into a taxi cab that night like she told her friends she was going to? Yeah, because we have a very short period of time here to be concerned with. We know that she was last seen alive and well at 2 a.m. that morning, and her body is found at roughly, uh, I have 3.19 a.m. listed here. So that means we're dealing with 80, 90 minutes. Mm -hmm. Um, So we have a short period of time that that is unaccounted for, that Mia's unaccounted for. Well, the police are also going to find scuff marks on her shoes. You know, kind of evidence that maybe she was dragged. I think mm-hmm. this would be kind of difficult because, especially like in the 90s, I mean, I don't think I had a shoe without scuff marks on it. Well, it's 90s and the grunge scene. Uh, people, you know, dressing in tattered clothes mm-hmm. uh, in that scene. And and from the video footage I've seen, uh, that was kind of her outfit was tattered clothes. Right, but, but there could have been more evidence that pointed like, you know, fresh scuff marks or something. Mm-hmm. Uh, now the thing here, she didn't have any identification on her. Uh, so she, they, it wasn't like once they brought her to the medical examiner's office that they were able to just open up a, a purse or pull out, uh, identification from her pockets and know immediately who she is. Um, but the, somebody working in the medical examiner's office was familiar with the local music scene and was familiar with the band, the gets. Mm-hmm. Um, and I also believe that on her hoodie, that it was a band hoodie. So since they have this information, they're able to start retracing her steps and start questioning people pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. And like the captain said, the first thought is, did she get in a cab? You know, this was somebody that was known to take cabs. Lots of cabs were used in this area. Mm -hmm. She told her friend she was going to take a cab and go home. Days before Ubers. Mm -hmm. So you have to wonder what happened to her during this 80-minute time period. Mm -hmm. The other other rumor around this, too, was that she just recently had a breakup. Well, police could find no evidence or no proof that she got into a cab that night. Um, And then regarding the boyfriend, uh, they basically say that he he assisted as much as anybody possibly could in the investigation. Mm -hmm. He answered all their questions. He was eager to come forward and talk with police. Uh, He submitted himself to any test that they asked for. Yeah. I believe he took a lie detector test. Uh, There was also thought that maybe that she was going to try to drop by his house that night, you know, like maybe based on conversations that, you know, she had a couple drinks or whatever and she was feeling bad and maybe wanted to make amends or, or who knows. But uh, there was no evidence to show that she uh, went to his house. And he also had, I think, a pretty solid alibi as well. So how did Mia die? How was she killed? Well, she was was brutally beaten. Uh, She was raped and she was strangled. She was strangled, obviously, with the the string from her hoodie. Um, The medical, according to the medical examiner... She had she not been strangled, she would have died from internal injuries suffered from the beating. Um, it was that bad. They found the autopsy found evidence of a, a struggle in which Zapata suffered from blunt impact to her abdomen and a lacerated liver. So had she not been strangled, she would have probably lied there and and passed away eventually from those that attack. We'll dive right back into the initial investigation of Mia Zapata right after this quick beer break. All right, cheers, mates. I want to quickly thank everybody that has left a five-star review. It really helps the show. We're discussing the murder of young Mia Zapata. She was 27 years old, found dead July 7th, 1993. Uh, This was about 3.30 in the morning when she was found. Now, police have been investigating. As we said, they already spoke to her boyfriend. Uh, But this is going to bring them to her inner circle, you know, talking to her friends, family, band members, people in the area that she, that she knew. And one thing that's going on here is that it's clear during the course of this questioning to her friends and band members that not only was she brutally beaten, attacked and strangled, Mm -hmm. um, but Mia was raped uh, when she was attacked. 
And this was something that they were asking the people that they were questioning to keep to themselves. Um, this was not something that they had released to the general public. But I just wonder why they were doing that. Um, I, I think that here's, here's the speculation I got for you. Um, part of her attack was they found bite marks on her chest and breast area. Mm -hmm. Um, and this would have been something that would not have been known. Um, I think that they were probably keeping that especially to themselves where maybe they were able to question these people and talk about the, the rape or that she was sexually assaulted without including that portion of it. There's a couple things here. One, that's something that only the killer would know. And Mm -hmm. you and I know from talking about these cases so often that when you have, when you have crazies come out of the woodwork and somebody comes up and confesses to this, well, they have to know certain details about the crime. The other thing too, is if they can get somebody to slip up during the course of questioning and reveal information that they've not revealed, then they know they're on the right path. Right. That leads to the smoking gun. But I also wonder if it's because of her, you know, her, her status, you know, as far as, you know, the lead singer of a band that their, the band was, you know, had some success going and that they would have been known by a lot of people. And so maybe like you were saying, it brings out, you know, another level of crazy. What if it was just like some obsessed fan that comes out and admits to the murder for no reason? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you have to worry about that with any case, but especially in one like this. Now this is, this is going to be tough for her friends. Because we're, we're talking about, like, you know, we said Mia's kind of in-your-face aggressive person when she's on stage. You, you've you seen these crowds. Uh, the people that would have gone and seen her bands, they're not people that like to sit on their hands and go, well, we're not doing anything about this. Mm-hmm. Uh, our, our friend was, was killed and she was raped and we're not allowed to talk about it. And that can be hard for any circle, but I'm guessing maybe especially hard for this circle of friends. All right. So the evidence that we have right now is that we know that Mia was, she was raped. She was sexually assaulted. Now we have no DNA evidence of this, right? We have no DNA left over, right? There is no semen um, found. Correct. That kind of goes nowhere. Mm -hmm. Um, The police don't want her friends talking about that. But now we have these bite marks that we have no definitive impressions. So we can't match it up with somebody else's, you know, teeth. Right. But we possibly have some DNA evidence there. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's also, they, the police found some metal pieces, like debris almost, like small bits of metal, mm-hmm. uh, either on or around her body. Uh, they, they never really give any kind of conclusion to what this was or where it came from. Um, you know, you and I talked about, you know, she was known to have wore a Walkman everywhere she went, the old Sony Walkman. Um, and for those of you not old enough to remember, that's the tape deck that you put in your pocket or strap it to your side and mm-hmm. you can walk amongst town and listen to all your favorite music and cassette tapes. Um, <laughs> great advertisement. Well, nobody's selling those anymore, so mm-hmm. nobody cares. Uh, but I'm guessing that they, it, these items, this metal bits and pieces wouldn't have come from that Walkman. Uh, it very well could have because it's a small device. However, you know, there's no no mention that it was destroyed in the attack. Yeah, and I think what investigators were questioning here is that we, like we said before, we have, you know, you start speculating she's she's her body is dropped by this church and by this uh, Catholic you know, community center, mm-hmm. and her body's in this pose of maybe a crucifixion. You start wondering, is there some meaning behind these metal objects? The other thing that's weird to it during this time period, as far as like grunge music goes, that's part of, uh, you know, a lot of people would wear, I think Chris Cornell used to wear like a fork or something. Mm -hmm. Uh, so some odd types of jewelry. So maybe that was part of, you know, just something that she was wearing, uh, or was it just in the area that her body was dumped? Yeah. I remember people used to make jewelry out of things that look like trash almost, Mm -hmm. you know, like, uh, like you said, a fork or a screw or a, a bone or anything like that. Um, that's a possibility. I also wondered though, if, you know, they, they say that she was killed elsewhere and then brought there. Yeah. You well, know? cause here's the weird thing. So she's at her friend's house. Then her body's found, you know, a good hour and a half later mm-hmm. and only a half mile from that friend's house. 
Right. So, you know, one, is there an alley or anything there that she could have been attacked with? And I'm sure that law enforcement looked into that. And if they didn't see any signs, you know, there are other crime scenes, right? Mm -hmm. That maybe that's why they were saying, hey, we believe that she was taken somewhere else. And, but my first thought would be is at some point during this attack, she was on the ground. Um, and this could, these pieces of metal could it had, it simply been something that was picked up by her clothing. Well, she necessarily didn't have to be on the ground. She could have been, you know, in a vehicle. Yes, that's, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but what I mean is she would have been lying, uh, in a situation where she could have picked up her clothing could have picked up pieces of things, whether it be on the ground or a car seat or the floor of a car, um, and could have been transferred to this area through that manner, um, or through the process of, was she drugged to this area? Did Mm -hmm. somebody drag her to this area? You know, we mentioned the scuff marks on her shoes, but there was also additional scuff marks. Uh, there was some bruising on her side, which, which is hard to determine whether that was part of the attack or maybe part of being dragged to this area. Uh, there was also some scuff marks on her belt as well. So we don't know how much of her was being dragged when transported and placed at this location. Well, and, and look, I mean, depending on the the surface area that she's being dragged on, I mean, it could have been that she was dragged three feet and got those scuff marks. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's kind of hard to tell there. But what's interesting here is, you know, she was leaving. And then the question is, you know, if law enforcement believes that she was taken somewhere else, well, how did she get there? She, right. she obviously left her friend's house. She's obviously on the street. Okay, so now how does she get into the vehicle? Because this individual, Mia, does not seem like somebody that would go, hey, uh, girl, I got some candy. And she would go, hey, let me jump in your car. No, she was far too smart. She's not falling for that. Right. And so it's like, what? how did this? Uh, how did the attacker get her into the vehicle? Mm-hmm. I, w- I would have to guess if she, if she ended up in a vehicle or ended up in an apartment. And, and why do you say, you know, Nick Captain, well, why, why do you immediately jump to a car or apartment? That's the area that we're talking about. That would be the quickest method of getting somebody into a secluded area to do this type of attack. And you have, we have no eyewitnesses. You know, if this were attack to me that, that were out in the open, you know, out on the street, what did we say that was the near the intersection of 24th and South Washington, Mm -hmm. if that attack would have taken place there, she was found by somebody that was walking by. She was found by a pedestrian. There would have been eyewitnesses in my mind. Right. And so there's zero eyewitnesses. I mean, we don't have a, we don't even have an eyewitness of seeing uh, a girl dragged into a car or out of a car. Right. So this to me looks like a very quick attack um, where somebody was able to, to grab her, attack her and abduct her and pull her either into a car or a nearby, uh, building or apartment. Well, and she was badly beaten. So you wonder if, you know, you know, initial hit, you know, a lot of people speculate that maybe she put on her Walkman and it was like, well, I'm just going to walk home and, and what do we do? And we hear this all the time, you know, we'll get pictures every week of listeners in a park and they're listening to our, our show while they're run. Mm-hmm. And all I think is, why are you doing that? I mean, I appreciate you listening to the show, but uh, when you're not familiar with the surroundings, especially at 2 o'clock in the morning, mm-hmm. and it's super dark, and you're walk, walking home, you blast that music, you're cutting off one of your sensors. Yeah. So, I don't know, it's a scary thing. And, and, and I do it too. I mean, I'll bike at night, and I blast some music and take off on my bike. But I, I don't think we're not in constant fear that we're going to be attacked. And so the possibility is that her attacker could have, you know, been several inches away from her without her possibly knowing. Mm-hmm. So she's blasting this music. Maybe, you know, he hits her from behind and then grabs her. She could have potentially been followed uh, shortly after leaving her friend's apartment. Um, and who knows how long she could have been followed for before she was attacked. Like you said, I mean, she's walking in the dark, most likely with her headphones on. Um, it's It would be, and I hate to say this, 
uh, because it sounds like I'm on the bad guy side, which everybody knows I'm not, but it would be an ideal way to track somebody or follow them. Meaning, what are you saying? Well, she's walking alone in the dark without without her ears. Like you said, you're taking away one of your senses. Mm -hmm. You could potentially follow that person for several blocks uh, and they might not even notice that you've been you've been trailing behind them at some distance for some time, waiting for this potential victim to walk into an area that would be uh, a, a better situation for the attacker. Yeah. Um, it, well, it's really frustrating with this area, this Capitol Hill area, with there being there no eyewitnesses, right? Mm-hmm. Because I mean, we know that Mia walked from a bar. Yeah. Right. So we have bars in this area. And again, now it's that's one of the things that's so frustrating here uh, for me as far as when we dive into these cases is I know what time bars close here, right? And then you know we're we're talking about one uh, different parts of the country, but we're also talking about different times in history. Mm-hmm. So who knows? But you would assume that you know there'd be some pedestrians out walking, getting cabs in their cars, you know, getting home from bars around two o'clock. Well, she walked often. She took cabs often. Uh, this is an area that I've been told, and from what I've read, this is an area, like we said, that cabs were frequently used in this area. Um, mm-hmm. I No disrespect to the good people of Seattle, but the way Capitol Hill has been described to me is an area that has um, you know, girls working the streets, and we have uh, a good amount of drug activity going selling, on. Are they selling lemonade? That's right. Uh, oh, some of the best lemonade you've ever had, my friend. Uh, but this, right. This, so there's sex workers. Okay. Yes. This might not ring true to this day, but when you're talking about the early nineties, mm-hmm. that's what was going on in this area. This, it was, this is what this area was thought of. During well, the and, and what, well, right. And then law enforcement then has to start thinking, okay, well, she's out with some friends. Did a friend come and drive by and see her and say, Hey, do you need a ride? Mm-hmm. Now we we got now we're going down a whole different area. But then that friend, you know, that'd be like the friend stalking her to f- get the opportunity. The, my other question here is: Was the attacker, you know, here's an easy way to get her in the car. You you pretend that you're a taxi, mm-hmm. right? And she gets in the car. Mm-hmm. So that's a possibility as well. It's certainly a possibility. Um, you know, with no eyewitnesses. The the other thing, Captain, we uh, have not mentioned yet. They had a, um, when I say they, I mean the Gits, had a rehearsal space. Uh, and I'm a little unclear as to what exactly the space was. I've heard it described as a studio. I've read that it was simply a rehearsal space or maybe a hangout space. Yeah, well, sometimes it's... <laughs> It's deceiving. It's because, all three. <laughs> well, sometimes it's deceiving because people will say, hey, come down to my rehearsal studio. Mm-hmm. And when you hear the word studio, you think, you know, mixing board and big monitors and, and, and that kind of stuff. But, you know, then you show up and you're like, okay, we're at this rehearsal studio. And it's just a big empty room. It's a lamp and a harmonica. And you're going, <laughs> what's going on in here? I love lamp. They had a space in this area that, that, was used by either Mia or and or the band. Um, and one thing that came up early in the investigation was they had wondered maybe had she dropped by there after leaving her friend's apartment, or this is the even more scary thing, could this have potentially been an area where she would have been attacked? Would she have been attacked inside of this uh, rehearsal space? Right, and there's no evidence that she's attacked tacked inside of this space. You're exactly right. What led them to the conclusion was a, the proximity and B, I guess there was an item or two, um, that were items that they considered that they considered them to be items that she normally would carry on her person. Uh, well, and and these were items that were later found at the rehearsal space. Uh, but like you said, there would have been, she's brutally attacked. mm -hmm. She's brutally attacked. There is a scuffle a struggle that mm-hmm. happened at some point. And I think there would have been obvious signs of that in this space. Well, yeah. And then the other question too, is if she was taken away, why would you, if, as the attacker, right? Mm-hmm. Why would you attack an inv- individual, pull him away, right? Uh, attack him somewhere else, murder him somewhere else. And then when you go to drop him off, drop them back in the same location that you found them. Mm-hmm. You, you'd think you would 
want to drop them further away because therefore maybe people wouldn't recognize the victim. Yeah. And one of her friends in an interview said, you know, and this is a very good point is, you know, she's a vocalist. She is, the, she, she is the leader of, of this band of this punk heavy band, you know, so she's not just a vocalist, a singer, but a screamer, a yeller. Um, yeah, I think their drummer, Steve was talking about that saying, look, I've, I've heard her yell many, uh, many times. Yeah. You know, we went on tour and she yelled many, and, many times. And he was extremely surprised. And I think we all should be at the fact that there was no eyewitness coming forward saying that, you know, oh, I heard screams and then I, then a block later I saw this. Um, there was, there was a guy, there was a, a, a man sleeping in an apartment near this area mm-hmm. that did say he heard some screams around 3 a.m. that morning. So this would have just been about 19, 20 minutes before she was found. Um, could it be now? Did they say male screams or female screams? Or um, not it, clear on that. It, I'm I'm definitely not clear on that. Um, it sounds to me like this guy would have been a few blocks. His apartment was a few blocks away from uh, her Mia's friend's house that she had left. Um, this very likely could have been Mia. Like we said, you know, she when she was found, they were trying to resuscitate her. There was a chance there. Uh, she might have been. She may have been dropped at that location just minutes before the pedestrian walking by found her. Yeah, I, I wondered this. I couldn't find this anywhere. Maybe you know the answer. Do you know where they found her wallet? Because she had no ID on her. Right. I don't know where they found that. I wonder if this is a complete guess. So don't put any weight into this. But my guess would be that it would have been uh, either where she was living, whether where she was staying. Mm-hmm. Um, I get the, I get the impression that she didn't bring extra things with her when, when unnecessary, the bar that she went to that night was a place that she had been many times would not have required an identif an ID, uh, to get into the bar or to drink at the bar. Yeah. Those are the best bars, right? Mm-hmm. When you uh, just get, walk in and just walk in, Hey, hey Phil, hey. <laughs> Tim, what's yeah. up? The best is when you don't have your wallet and you just go put it on my tab. Yeah. Or Tom, where's that 50 you owe me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you gotta collect the money before you start drinking. No, seriously, Tom, I want my fifty bucks. But while we're on the subject of of the bar scene mm. and drinking with friends, this is what's haunting to me. And I heard several of her friends say it, and, and read several of her friends say this in interviews. And this is something that really hits home for all of us: is that they, a lot of them, believed you know this was a brutal attack. She's found out in the open. Mm -hmm. Uh, You almost feel like when you hear how how brutally she was attacked, she's found out in the open in the middle of the night. Your first thought is this is probably something that could be solved very quickly, that they might be able to apprehend this person. He left something at the scene or left something on her that's going to lead you to this maniac immediately. Yeah. And you're going to be able to apprehend this guy. We're going to have a face for the monster that did this to our friend. And when days go by and then days turn into weeks and then to months, well, you start, you start wondering where is this guy? Who did this? Who did this to our friend? Wait a second. Was it one of our friends? Was it somebody that ran in our circle? Was it somebody that was involved in the Seattle music scene, whether it be, uh, uh, from another band or somebody yeah, that followed the the music. Yeah, it could. Be, I mean, first with almost every case, I mean, you start looking at ex lovers, mm-hmm. right? But those ex lovers, I mean, we know this with bands from being in one. But it's like you know your bandmates, you know all their girlfriends, mm-hmm. and then or in this case, a boyfriend. Mm-hmm. So you so you know that if it's one of them, you you met this psycho before. And so you have that, but then you also got, you know, was it another jealous band or a jealous singer? Mm-hmm. I mean, because think about how many times you play a gig with a band and there's just that asshole band where you, you, you might like them, but you're never going to say that you like them because they're kind of your rival band. Mm-hmm. So was there any of that going on? And like you said, now it's weeks later, you're drinking, you're not on tour because because of this horrible crime. And you're sitting around the scene and hanging out at bars and thinking, you know, 
is the is the murderer here? Am yeah. I having a beer with the murderer? It is the guy that did this sitting four stools from me? You know. Yeah. Well, and and the other thing, the one of the reasons that law enforcement really thought this had to be somebody that she knew was they're they're implicating the idea that um she was strangled. And what was her voice or what what was her instrument? Her instrument was her voice. Yeah. And that the fact that she was strangled, that somebody was trying to maybe destroy her talent, her gift. Mm -hmm. And so maybe that would lead to some sign that, you know, this was some uh, jealous uh, musician or other band person. Or more what I think more likely would be maybe even a, an obsessed fan. Yeah. Um, you know, that the thought of her as that vocalist, as that singer, and only saw her as that. I've never had an obsessed fan. Um, I don't. <laughs> Nick, Nick was the singer, quote unquote, singer of our band. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> you had a lot more. I, I don't know that I did. Yeah, I didn't pay any attention. Oh yeah, there'd there'd be all these girls that would come up and say, uh, "I just want to let you know that I love your singer." Or the best, <laughs> I always thought they were going to say that they loved me, but never happened. Most of those girls told me that the captain sang be better than I did. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. they were playing games with all of us. They were tone deaf. So obviously, just like we said at the start of this show, there the the lack of leads. There was a mm -hmm. there was there was no leads. There's no leads. Evidence. What kind of evidence do we got here, Captain? We got very little to almost no evidence at all. Well, yeah, we had a lot of speculation. A lot of speculation, but so little evidence to the point where after they interview friends and people in her inner circle and they have to release some information to get information back from them, they're asking them to be quiet and not talk about this stuff. So, well, right. But then as far as law enforcement goes, because I mean, they were doing their due diligence, right? Right. They were collecting all this stuff. They were. You know, uh, there's a lot of law enforcement officers that would walk up onto the scene and not realize that she might have been posed mm -hmm. or or recognize where she, you know, where the body was dropped. Right. You know, that's all I'm saying. So they're doing their due diligence. And then every turn, it's like, OK, we know she's sexually assaulted, but we don't have any DNA evidence. But let's go back to those bite marks. Again, we have bite marks, but we don't have the, it's not enough to, you're not gonna be able to match those to any kind of dental records or anything like that. They're right. basically getting, uh, what they would refer to as, uh, teeth scrapings right. from, um, which would provide some form of DNA evidence for them. This is going to be basically little bits of saliva, yeah. uh, that they're going to find on her person. And they know they can, they can determine that whoever put that saliva there would have had to have done that at the time of her death. Right. Uh, so that is your red flag. And that's going to be, you know, we, unfortunately, you know, I sigh when I say this, but unfortunately we have had to cover so many cases that we've seen, uh, you know, maybe the police department or investigators don't know exactly what they're dealing with or are unable to handle a certain case. That's not this case. This no. case, they did their work. They did the hard work. They did the hard work to the point of this. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about 1993. DNA uh, evidence isn't even that big at this point. Right, right. There's still a lot to learn and a lot of growing room left as far as DNA evidence goes. They went so far to, to determine this. We have some DNA. Mm -hmm. We have a tiny little bit that we can get from the saliva that we found. The problem is... It's such a minuscule amount that if we test it, this is a huge problem. We're very likely going to destroy it and never be able to test it again. Right. And so if, if, if there that is happens, a mistake, right. If that happens, I've heard several investigators state regarding this crime that if they don't have DNA evidence at this point in the investigation, they have nothing. Mm -hmm. So, one thing that I think is brilliant here that they decide, you know what, rather than throw, rather than push all of our chips in and risk it all, unfortunately, we're going to have to put this on the shelf, right? We're going to have to hold back and we're going to have to see what possible developments come in the way of DNA evidence to see if we're able ever going to be able to use this and test it appropriately. Well, and think about her friends and her family uh, and the band members at this point, right? Mm -hmm. they're hearing all these updates and they're going, okay, well, so you have DNA evidence, right? Right. Well, we'll test it. 
right? And then and think about this too, especially one of your loved ones is brutally murdered and you have this evidence. I mean, there's a part of you that wants to take the gamble, right? Oh, I would think so. I, I would definitely think so. And so they're kind of faced with this tough thing, you know, do you put pressure on law enforcement to try to get them to test it? What do you do? But I think in this case, and we're and, and I, one of the main reasons why we're covering this is to, to point out something that you can do. And the secret weapon in this case is going to be her bandmates, the gets, mm-hmm. right? And, and they're going to really come to the forefront and almost uh, champion this case, keep her name in the spotlight, and, and try to get answers and closure for her family. Yeah, and it's it's strange how how life can, you know, even death can reflect life in a way. And and I and I applaud the gets for sticking by their their fallen uh friend. Mm-hmm. Because you know, they could have very easily gone one of two ways, you know, we had this whole thing going on. We were riding this roller coaster and it was on its way up and our dreams got crushed. Not only did I lose a friend, but my dream got crushed too. Right. This is too much for me to take. I'm out of here. Or, or you can, you can try to carry on. You can try to carry on and you can continue to do your music thing. Yeah, but at well, the same time, well, it's not even about time, that, but I think they stepped up and said, look, this is an individual that we loved and we're going to fight to get answers. Well, and a lot of times, Captain, the reason why a good performer, a good artist is able to stand on stage and mm-hmm. have a voice in front of a band is because they have friends behind them playing instruments that have their back. Right. And just just like in her life, as goes her death with the investigation, these guys, the gits, they had her back. And remember, Mia Zapata was not just a victim. She was an artist. Uh, she was a creator. Check out her work and check out her band, The Gits. All right, I'm fired up. Let's let's stick around and get to part two. I agree. And that's why if you're listening and you haven't subscribed already, sometimes we drop these episodes early. So make sure you subscribe. Until next time, be good, be kind, and don't let it.